Hello, welcome back. Um, part two of the Crown Court update concerning the case for Peter of England, uh, or as the Crown would say uh, in the latest communication that they sent to me by email three days before, uh, Peter of England, in brackets, Peter Smith. So it seems like they were trying to ride both horses at, at once here, uh, but not confronting or, or dealing with the, the issues in question. So, uh, as evidenced, or, or just mentioned, the case then got underway with me deciding to represent as Alan Peter Michael Smith, so that the judge had, had something to work with. In hindsight, I don't know whether that was a, a good idea or it was a bad idea, but you can be the judge of that in, in due course. So, the first thing that happens is that the prosecution leads away by calling the first witness. The first witness that was called was the police constable who arrested me, um, and that was a guy called PC Dean Siggers. Uh, after he'd read his, his testimony, um, the barrister uh, asked him a question, and then I actually interjected at the end by saying that what I would like to do now is obviously cross-examine PC Dean Siggers, but also deal with the four counts in reverse order. That's fourth, which was driving without a license. Third was um, failing to stop when instructed to do so by a, um, a, a police officer. Second one was resisting arrest, defending my property and not allowing the policeman to enter. And then the final one was uh, driving without insurance under the uh, section 143 of the Road Traffic Act 1988, I believe. Now, at that point, the judge was quite surprised um, because he said, I only have one charge in front of me here. The barrister for the prosecution, for the Crown Prosecution, said, uh, yes, Your Honour, there was originally four charges, but we're only, we're only proceeding with what we think is the most important one. So the judge was completely unaware, not only of the fact that there were other charges, if this be true, but also he was totally unaware that I'd provided any other documentation in the Magistrate's Court on the 10th of uh, October. So this is either a deliberate ploy to remain ignorant so he can make the case as simple as possible, but also proving these places aren't courts of record, they're simply notes that the judge has in front of them and are nothing more than trumped up tribunals or star chambers where, where anything can, can pass as law. So, having then got onto the fact of the driving license issue, um, the judge then asked after I had explained the fact that there was a mistake here, that my license had been revoked by an error from the DVLA in 2010, and I'd in fact been driving for two years unbeknownst to myself with a revoked license, he asked if there was a license available. I produced the license, and then the most strange thing happened. They spent probably nearly five minutes uh, turning it upside down, looking at it, passing it between the magistrates and the judge, then the judge gave it to the clerk, the clerk handed it over to, uh, um, I think it was D.C. Gary Staff, who, with, when then asked with his, whether his expert opinion could verify that it was a driving licence, it being the old type, the paper type, um, after some moments, D.C. Gary Staff confirmed that, uh, yes, it looked like a valid UK licence for the categories of vehicle that I was entitled to drive. And so we moved on from that uh, onto the other points where I then uh, confronted in the witness box uh, PC Dean Siggers by stating that I hadn't pulled the vehicle over on the hard shoulder of the A120 because there was no hard shoulder and that I knew that in fact we were going to get into probably quite a prolonged discussion and that I didn't pull the vehicle over because Unbeknownst to him at the time, I was there maybe to protect him and his co-crown officer, police woman friend, because I knew that we were going to have a, a prolonged discussion. On that point, he said that there was a lay-by somewhere along there that if I'd have been paying attention, uh, I should have pulled into. I couldn't verify whether that's true or not, and I don't know whether anyone does know whether that's true or not. Maybe we can look that up. So then with the next part of the... Uh, 
concerning that um, failing to stop, he said that I should have seen his lights flashing, which I didn't. I acknowledged the fact that I'd seen the blue light go on for probably a period of no more than three seconds. I mentioned also why, I asked him why he hadn't come up alongside me to indicate I should pull over, or why he hadn't pulled in front. Um, he didn't really answer that question, he just basically said, I must have seen him in the rear view mirror, and uh, um, I basically then maintained that I pulled over at the most, um, the most suitable point, and that was on the uh, slip road of the M11, just uh, off the roundabout. Um, and so that was a valid point. He admitted I stopped voluntarily, and there was no question of that. The next part was then coming to the question about them entering the vehicle. I maintain that I have the right to defend my home. I created it as a, in the case, as a private dwelling house. It was my main principle and only residence, which is provable factually and was proven in paperwork handed to the court. Uh, and therefore, I had the right of self-defence in addition to a statutory right that prohibits the police entering a private dwelling for the seizure of, of goods uh, without a warrant. So these points were, were, were made. We then went on to finally the part about the, um, the insurance and I maintained the fact that I had lodged three ounces of 99% pure gold at the Newcastle 750181 Court of Record Common Law. And this would have been adequate under a common law contractual agreement or an open contract for any claim against me. Um, there are statistics that I could have brought up and mentioned, but I didn't, and so there I left my, my opening statements. The barrister then um, took over the, the next part of the case for the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, asked one or two more questions. Um, my questions then concerning the right to self-defence my statutory rights, and also my rights under common law, were then, as far as the judge was concerned, said to be a matter of law, and that he would then deal with them in any summing up. Uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything now before I, I, I start to, to wrap this up um, that I may have missed. Uh, I think I've covered all the, all the main points. Uh, this is the passport that I produced to the court. And it's not that you're going to see it on there, but it's just to show there's the passport in the name of Alan Peter Michael Smith, date of birth 1810-57. The next thing is that there is a birth certificate, Alan Peter Michael Smith, date of birth 18th of October 57, and also bank statements and other documents. There is an Alan Peter Michael Smith in the public domain as a as a straw man entity. The Peter Smith that they were searching for is nothing more than a casual identification or a nickname. Uh, they initially provided no evidence that the individual that was pulled over on the hard shoulder of the A20, sorry, on the uh, slip road of the uh, M11, is in fact the same identity as Alan Peter Michael Smith. Uh, so the burden of proof rests very, very heavily to provide the identity of the accused, and therefore me became, becoming the, or Peter of England becoming an appellant, the burden of proof rests solely on the prosecution. And they did not, what's called, pass the judge at the initial uh, stages with this, and it's been ignored. So, this is coming up to the end of ten minutes here. We're going to go into part three now, and I'll give you a summary.